Little Phillies over at Calkins Media, at Kevin Cooney on Twitter, writes an interesting piece uh, regarding Aaron Nola, who's not pitched well the last couple times out, as the Phillies all of a sudden, Kevin, the team that we thought they would be is starting to show, and is it carrying over to some of the guys who had uh, not been infected by the way that this team was supposed to look at the start of the season? First, Mike, I got to say, Summer's Point for the draft sounds a lot better than where I'll be in Brooklyn. So I got <laughs> to admit, I'm a little jealous. A lot of um, beers, a lot of beers over there for all our listeners. Yeah, it's a lot <laughs> less expensive than getting to Brooklyn, too. Like, <laughs> like, um, yeah, this is – you kind of hit the hit nail on the head. I mean, this is what this team has reverted to. I mean, you know, everybody is knew that this was going to be a struggle and that there were going to be some ups and downs. And, and you know – I think some people got fooled after 24 and 17 and uh, they become buyers of the trade deadline and all that. No, nah, they, they weren't in a position where you figured they would make a leap forward. And to be honest, you also saw what the schedule was going to hold. It was going to have the, the, the six games against the Cubs, the six against the Nationals, Toronto for four. You had a trip to Detroit mixed in there. So the schedule was naturally going to bring that bubble down. It just completely collapsed. And as far as NOLA, and, and you know, I, I think that when you don't have any offense, I think that pitchers tend to believe they have to be completely perfect. And I think you saw it with NOLA the other night. I think you've seen it lately with Jeremy Hellickson. A lot more nibbling, not throwing the ball down in the zone. Neither one of them is power pitchers, so they can't just blow it by guys like, a, like Vince Velasquez would try to do. Um and I think what you've seen is when you nibble, you get hurt, and their location is off, and quite frankly, they were they are getting tattooed by good lineups. Yeah, and uh, figure where they would be had it not been for that run of one-run games they kept winning with a bullpen that Scott Profrock told me the other day was their biggest surprise. They never anticipated this bullpen uh, being where they are, but now we're also seeing the bullpen leak a little oil. Yeah, I think in Wall Street it's termed a correction, and I think Hector <laughs> Neris is undergoing a correction at this point. I mean, because, look, I mean, this was a guy that was going to be a long guy, and because of the potluck nature of the bullpen early, when you didn't know about Gomez, when David Hernandez struggled early and all that, you you threw Neris into a situation, and he thrived there with that split finger for the first two months of the season. Now... I think he his arm slot, Pete McCannon's talked a lot about his arm slot being down, perhaps has a little bit from overuse. Um, you know, I, I just think that now the adjustment's going to have to be made. I think Hector Neres still could be a pretty good pitcher for this team down the road. Is he an eighth inning guy? I, I don't quite know that. I wouldn't think so, but I think he could be somebody that fits in their plans. But you got to get the mechanics worked out. Kevin Cooney's with us, Calkins Media, the Phillies uh, with a four-game set against the Arizona Diamondbacks. And uh, now the hard part for the Phillies, they they told Ryan Howard he's going to go to the bench. He got a chance to DH a couple times, so it kind of, you know, staved off the inevitable here. Uh, but what is now down the road for them? I mean, is this going to come to a messy divorce? Is he just going to languish away on the bench for the rest of the season? How do you foresee the Howard thing playing out now that there's no DH opportunities coming up? Well, yeah, I mean, their next DH opportunities, I believe, well, they have uh, Minnesota next week, so they will have some DH opportunities next week when they're on the road that first series. But, uh, look, I think Ryan Howard's going to be here the rest of the year, provided that Ryan Howard doesn't make a scene. I think that if Ryan Howard's willing to sit on the bench, collect his paycheck, and be a mentor, because I think this team really does need some veterans. I mean, you only have Carlos Ruiz and him, who I would consider big-time veterans who know what it's like to play in playoff games and all that, and could help this group in the transition year of what to see, you know, how to conduct yourself, what to look out for, all that. I think that is probably the best case scenario for the Phillies, but the minute that Ryan Howard makes a peep about, you know, when T Tommy Joseph's in a slump now, if Ryan Howard goes, hey, I should be starting more, I want, you know, or, you know what, maybe I don't want to be here, then you got to get rid of him. But at this point, Howard has not indicated that he would have a problem with it, so I don't see what the harm is, Mike, because to be honest, mm -hmm. who's he blocking? 
he's not blocking anybody on this roster that you think is a prospect at his uh, position. You know, if the Phillies need an outfielder with Nick Williams, you know, Peter Borges is going to be the guy that gets jettisoned. If they need a pitcher, let's say it's Ben Lively or Jake Thompson or something, they have a host of people they can get rid of. I mean, between trading Hellickson or, or, or sending Adam Morgan back to the minors or whatever, you know, there's no first baseman there, uh, you know, and, and Darren Ruff is not the answer. I mean, so why why not just let Howard sit there and, and you know, if, at least have it end a little bit on a, if again, if Ryan Howard's good, let it end on, on somewhat of a, a, a decent tone. Yeah, you said something there, too, that, that is, uh perked my ears, though, is Joseph, if Joseph just starts to go down the tank. Because, you know, the other day it was interesting, Profrock said, he didn't even recognize who Joseph was. Like, they didn't have him on the radar at all in Clearwater. He said, I walked up and saw him, didn't even know who the guy was. He lost a lot of weight, but they did not have him in the plans to be doing what he's doing now. But if he just all of a sudden starts to go with a big downward spiral, you wonder if Pete McAdin uh, will be inclined to give Howard another spot if he sees his veteran, you know, franchise, former franchise player just sitting there on the bench. I don't think Pete would do that. I think that, well, Tommy Joseph, because of the way he hit up until the last nine days, eight, nine days, okay, through the minors and his first three and a half, four weeks in the majors, I think Pete's going to give him a long-term kind of uh, look. Even when Joseph has struggled now, even uh, last night, a couple balls he hit, he hit hard. I mean, so it's not – he has to work – on cutting down the strikeouts, maybe taking a walk or two more. But if you're the Phillies at this point, this season, you know, you're at seven below 500. You know, this it's going to get a little worse as the rest of the year goes on. Hmm. You're probably looking at, again, 70 to 75 wins, I think, is the, the ceiling for this team. Um, you know, why not let see if Tommy Joseph is an everyday player? Keep playing him out there because it may answer a question for you heading into 2017. Kevin, um, obviously, as you mentioned, uh, they might be 70-75 wins, which means at some point you, you might want to turn the page on some of these guys. You know, one of the things Prof Rock told me the other day was also that, you know, look, we're not done evaluating some of the guys we have here, you know, whether or not mm-hmm. Tyler Goodell can play or Cody Ashy can play. Um, are there guys that uh, on this team you want to see more of, or are there guys that you would rather say, you know what, I've seen enough, let's start to bring some of the other guys up. Is now the time, or do you think that some of these guys on the current roster do need more time? Well, I, I think that, you know, look, Cody Ashley just come back from the disabled list, so you're going to give him a little more time, okay? Have I seen enough of Peter Borges? Yeah, probably. And I know his defense is, is, is strong, but I'm not – really believing that Peter Borges should be here beyond mid to late July whenever you're going to bring Nick Williams up. Um, you know, Cesar Hernandez, if you believe J.P. Crawford's coming up, I think Cesar Hernandez is somebody that you have to look at, at moving out of here because, uh, you know, I think Freddie Galvis, rightly or wrongly, is a, strongly, is a stronger defensive player. Everybody knows that. And I think quite not, he's handled the situation better and look, Galvis is not a great hitter. He's never going to be a great hitter, but he's a little better of a overall player than Hernandez. So I, I'm getting close to the point where I've seen enough of Hernandez at this point. Other than that, you know, I, I think, Mike, this is just a natural attrition process that's going to happen, and some of it's going to happen before the end of the year. Most of it, I think, is going to happen in the off season. You know, I, if Cody actually doesn't have a, a, a good remainder of the season, he's going to be out of here. I mean, you know, there, there are enough outfield prospects. You know, Aaron Altair is going to come back at some point. That's when, you know, for Cody Ashey, it'll be time for him to move on. But at this point, I think that they, you know, you kind of let things play out naturally. Kevin Cooney, at Kevin Cooney on Twitter. Uh, the, the Phillies struggling along now, but uh, we're learning some things. And, uh, you know, one thing's for sure, uh, this team has, you know, at least fought and played a lot better than we anticipated up to a point, uh, you know, through the baseball season where we didn't think they'd be. We, we really didn't see them giving us a little bit of uh, reason to watch up to Memorial Day at least, right, Kevin? I mean, they, they you know, as, as Mackinnon said last night, we were seven games over. Now we're seven games under, but I certainly think we're better. I don't know that he's right about that, but at least they were fighting, and 
the last couple of years, there was apathy towards the team. There, that apathy is now gone. People are at least intrigued, which is you were, a feeling of moving well, in the right direction. Yeah, you'd rather be young and bad than, than old and bad because young and bad can get better. Ugh. I mean, old and bad is, is just futile, and that's what they were for three, four years. They were an old, bad team with bad attitudes and all that. Yeah, these kids... These kids are trying, and obviously there's the prospect of, of a major league, a, a major league, you know, future hanging in the balance for them. You know, when you have guys who are established guys, Papelbon, Lee, Hamels, all that, you know, when you lose, there's nothing more miserable. But, you know, they know they're around, and quite honestly, they want to get out of here. So, and they know they'll be wanted somewhere else. So I think that's what kind of was the problem the last couple of years. It was funny last night, Mike. We were looking back, and a couple of us tweeted this. Uh, last night was the worst loss, clearly, of la- of this season. It came on the one-year anniversary of the, the night that basically sealed Ryan Sandberg's fate, which was that 19-3 to fiasco in Baltimore hmm. when uh, yeah. when Frank Coor, when Frank Coor ended up pitching two innings and Chase Utley uh, freaked out on Bob McClure on the mound and Papelbon took the phone off the hook. So... Well, last night was a night, too, where you were looking for maybe a position player to get some innings for you. But let me ask you about that, because I guess this is a credit to Pete. Where would this team be if, if a guy like Sandberg was the manager? They would not be 30 and 37, which doesn't sound like a great team, but I, I think that's a to what Pete has done. Yeah, Pete, I think, has done a good job of keeping it as professional as possible. He understands what the situation is with this team. And, you know, it's a learning curve, and... Uh, you know, people can nitpick moves sometimes, and that's all well and good, except he doesn't really have the talent. But his job is to find out who is talented and who can be here and who can't and, and kind of show it for the front office. And I think Pete's done that pretty well while handling the situation with, you know, sometimes on, on a team like this, Mike, and, and I think Brett Brown is a good example with the Sixers, too. You need a communicator. More than an X and O guy, you need a guy who's going to communicate not just with it within the locker room, but with everybody else, and you know, kind of give a message of okay, we know what we're going through, all that. Hang in there. I think Brown has done that really well, and I think Pete's done that pretty well too. All right, uh, Kevin Cooney, follow him on Twitter at Kevin Cooney for the Phillies this weekend, and of course uh, the NBA draft stuff. Uh, we'll be at Charlie's. You'll be in Brooklyn. Enjoy that, Kevin. I will. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Take care, pal. Kevin Cooney.